good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Chad Coles. I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'll be your moderator tonight for our session on proximal femur fracture revisions. It's my pleasure this evening to be joined with uh, uh, faculty spanning from coast to coast. In the West, we've got Dr. Josh Gary, uh, who's an associate professor at uh, Los Angeles uh, at the University of Southern California. In the East, from Dr. Jennifer Hagan, uh, who's at the uh, University of Florida in Gainesville. So thank you to both uh, faculty for joining us tonight. Prior to tonight's events, any uh, potential financial conflicts have been uh, mitigated. Uh, they're displayed here uh, for your reference, uh, but uh, I, no conflicts were detected. As a reminder, AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society that's dedicated to improving the care of musculoskeletal uh, or patients with musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, it does not endorse or promote the use of any particular product or service uh, or any commercial entity. You'll see uh, representative slides tonight from several manufacturers and uh, at all times will attempt to remain as generic as possible. As well, any off-label uh, applications that we'll discuss tonight, we'll try to remember uh, to uh, mention uh, that those are off-label as well. As a reminder for Zoom etiquette tonight, all of your microphones are automatically muted and your cameras are turned off. We would ask you to keep those uh, off for us, please. Any questions that you have uh, for the presenters or for the moderator will attempt to address either live or uh, through the chat box uh, throughout the session. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to answer all the questions uh, as we go through. Um, the use of the chat box is reserved only for the faculty and staff, so we would ask that you not use the chat box tonight. For those of you who treat subdural canteric fractures, uh, once you've treated enough of them and seen enough of them, unfortunately, you'll encounter problems like this. Uh, it's not unique to nails. Uh, with extramedullary implants, we see plate uh, failures and non-unions, likely with an even higher incidence than with intramedullary nails. If you look at all comers for protrochanteric fractures, particularly in the subtrochanteric level, these are relatively common complications uh, quoted in the literature as high as 5%. It's an area where there's high mechanical stress, and it's also an area that's extremely intolerant of malreduction, particularly malreduction in varus. Um, we'll talk more about uh, tonight how to avoid that. Another area of subtrochanteric uh, fractures that we've seen, particularly in the last decade or so, that has become a, a broader uh, a recognition are these atypical femur fractures. Uh, you'll come to recognize the pattern almost instantly with this lateral beaking on the lateral aspect of the femoral cortex, again, often in the subtrochanteric level. There's also this endosteal beak uh, within the medullary canal, and this can cause some technical uh, difficulties during inch medullary nailing. Uh, that we'll talk a bit more about later. As well, you'll often see findings in the contralateral femur that you don't want to forget about as well. These are typically seen after prolonged bisphosphonate use, uh, usually over five years. Uh, they present some technical challenges for, for treatment and nailing and can also be associated with prolonged healing. So you really want to optimize your mechanical environment to try and minimize the complications and the non-unions that can come with these fractures. Our learning objectives for this evening, we recognize that not all of you will be treating uh, complex pertrochanteric and subtrochanteric non-unions, but all of you will be treating these subtrochanteric fractures and bisphosphonate fractures. So we'd like to leave you with some tips and tricks to optimize your outcomes. And our goals for this evening's sessions are for you to be able to optimize reduction to avoid non-union, to be able to manage atypical femur fractures, both of the fractured and also the potentially symptomatic contralateral femur, and to, if you do choose to treat the, the non-unions that can occur with these fractures, for you to be able to have a plan for outli uh, outlining the investigation and planning that revision surgery to optimize your outcomes. How we hope to achieve that this evening, we're going to split this into two sections. The first will be a 30-minute case session with cases for the PER and subtrochanteric region uh, presented by Dr. Hagen and Gary. Uh, we'll do a quick uh, question and answer session, followed by a second session with cases uh, presented then by Dr. Gary and Dr. Hagen on bisphosphonate fractures. We'll then review a journal article with some tips and tricks for uh, pertrochanteric or uh, uh, sorry, uh, subtrochanteric bisphosphonate fractures, uh, followed by a summary. And we'll hope to keep that all to 90 minutes so that you can get on with the rest of your evenings. 
We'll start off the first session, again, dealing with pertrochanteric non-union cases. Um, again, uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Hagen from the University of Florida is gonna lead off, and then followed by Dr. Joshua Gary from the University of Southern California. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Chad. So as I said, I'm gonna start it off with a proximal femur, which I'm calling early failure of fixation. And as we saw on the previous screen, unfortunately, I have no financial relationships. So my goals for this particular case are to identify aspects of the proximal femur fracture, which might be at risk, things that you can see that uh, can warn you that you're gonna have some difficult time getting a reduction and maintaining a reduction, to critically analyze any implant failure or failure fixation that you have, especially early. And as Chad alluded to, to, to plan for your revision if you are gonna be the one doing the revision. <clears throat> So my first case, this is a 70, 70 year old man who fell onto his right side from a bicycle at high speeds. This is a closed injury. It is an isolated injury. I'll tell you that there's nothing below it. There's no segmental femur fracture and there's no um, knee replacement. And he's otherwise very healthy other than uh, hyperlipidemia. So uh, before we move on, I was just say, Josh or Chad, is there anything about this fracture that kind of puts your eye up and makes your hair stand up? that um, you might have some issues with it. You know, Jen, one thing I see in the proximal segment is it looks like there's, it's likely complete, but it's hinged open between that lateral fragment on the shaft and then and then the medial fragment. So that is almost acted in, in a way like an ax. It looks like it's splitting it. So to me, it looks like that, that tube is opening up distally and is hinged proximally, which I think could create some issues with uh with staying away from from varus yeah absolutely absolutely you know you always look at the the elder pertro fracture you throw them on the fracture table it reduces and and you live happily ever after this is not one that gives me that impression um you know this is a long spiral fracture extending right up right and i expect exits out through the the gt uh, area uh, this is one that I'm going to consider more doing in a free-legged position so that I've got the ability to manipulate the leg. And I would have a very low threshold for opening this to facilitate that reduction. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So this was actually managed by one of my partners. <clears throat> they did do it on a fracture table, as you alluded to, but also realized that they were going to have some problems with reduction. So they did an open nailing. They did a lateral approach and at one point had the fracture clamped. This gentleman was incredibly tall. So this is actually the longest nail in this particular implant that they had. They decided to statically lock the, the head element, the blade up top. They allowed him to wait there for transfers only, uh, acknowledging that he was not a polytrauma and then he was discharged to rehab. So these are their initial post-op x-rays. Um, what do you guys think? I think all in all, actually, they did a pretty pretty good job. I think the alignment looks like they did overall a very nice job. I think the concern is if they open this and we talked about that tube proximally being disrupted, you know, if you're going to open it, I think cerclage in some form or fashion, usually with cables or wires, you know, reconstitutes a tube. And, and I think here, it, you, and it's not like you avoided the open approach uh, with this one because they did an open approach. So if you're there, I don't see judicious use of cables. Uh, one or two that don't strip all the blood supply, I think would have uh, increased the stability of their construct. Yeah, I agree. And I think we've all done these cases where we've got it clamped and it looks perfect when you clamp it and then you put the nail down and you kind of back away and everything looks great. And then the second they wake up and you get the post up, you start seeing these fracture fragments kind of splay, splay across, you know, especially when they have that split up the top. So, um, but I agree. All in all, I, I think uh, I think they started off really, really well. So Josh identified that separate lateral fragment and, and the, the tip of that screw that goes or blade that goes into the head really doesn't have much purchase in that lateral fragment. You know, your abductors are attached there. There's not much to keep that from escaping. So I, I agree. Cerclage would be uh, would be super helpful there. The only other thing I'll mention that the nail kind of goes in through the fracture site proximally and my one critique would have been that perhaps a, a bit more medial starting point because that looks like a lot of, of head neck offset. Um, yeah. So that would be my only other observation there. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, so he comes back for his two-week visit. Uh, he's been discharged from rehab. He claims he's been weight bearing only for transfers. Um, but we're starting to see some sliding of the blade uh, coming out the lateral aspect, which these implants can do when you lock them up top. Um, but he's not having a whole lot of pain. So his, his alignment is still good, maybe a little better, maybe it's just rotational, uh, but he's not having pain. So we decided to let it ride for a little bit. You guys agree with that? I, I don't think I do anything different at this point. It always concerns me when I see hardware moving this early, it, but I agree he's, he's almost fixed some of that offset that I mentioned earlier. So I, I, I would not intervene at this point. No, I, I don't think I'd intervene intervene either i am concerned that we're seeing a change in the implants uh the position but the alignment looks appropriate um I, I think if his pain were getting worse i think it'd be different him not hurting i'd watch this but i'd back him off on his rehab a little bit yeah agreed just looking at the q a real quick we got a question from joseph he says i see the lesser trope displaced proximally do you see a potential problem with this um a, I think it probably is more harbinger of the fact that the man's fairly active. Um, so I think he's probably been doing more than what he says and he's just pulling on that. Um, I, I usually don't worry about the lesser, uh, even in the higher energy ones. Do you, do you guys ever go after it? I think people have done that in the past and have been rewarded with some uh, disastrous outcomes. So I, I think that the teaching now is you just let that fly and, and I have never regretted that. Yeah, I, I feel the same. I've not seen many issues from a displaced lesser trochanter fragment, either functionally. Uh, I think the only issue is explaining it to the patient uh, in the clinic. Yeah, absolutely. And explain them that they're going to have pain with flexion of the hip for a while, um, but that will get better and they will get their strength back. So, Jen, a question from the chat box. Uh, you know, if you're doing this flat top on a table, how many assistants do you have? How much help do you need for this? Like for the, someone who's in a smaller center, how, how, how can they do this on their own? Do you have any tips for maintaining length uh, when you don't have many, many hands? Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, that's a great question. Right? So obviously I'm, I'm in a university setting, so I, I do have residents and, and a PA, but, but not always a ton of them. So I tend to do these lateral. And I think uh, Josh mentioned that too. So I tend to do these lateral um, if I think it's going to be one of these where I'm going to have a hard time obtaining and maintaining a reduction, <clears throat> I set myself up for success, get the open approach, get it clamped, and if using either a plate and or a surfage, get everything set, that way your, your tech really only has to pull traction, right? You have every, everything set so that you, even if you have a tech that you're doing, they, they don't do a lot of ortho. Um, I probably would have a lower threshold for doing a provisional fixation. Uh, maneuver like a surclage or a plate if I'm by myself. If I've got people who can pull for days, then sometimes I'll try it slow, you know, closed or percutaneous. But if it's just me, I'm opening and I'm getting it reduced and I'm doing something so that I can do hands off and put the nail in without worrying about losing the reduction. Another thing I found helpful, I do these uh, more in a supine position with a little bump underneath the hip, but I'll put a fine wire distal femoral traction pin, 20 pounds of weight over the end of the table. And that's sort of a surrogate for the traction that you would get with the use of a fracture table, but still allows me the, the flexibility of, to manipulate the leg. Uh, but I agree, it's helpful to have an extra set of hands for these cases. Yeah, I think, I think with clamps, you can generally do these with one assistant. You know, I, I do think that's a pertinent point, but you know, once you, the clamps will maintain the reduction and then you can instrument. But, but I think if you're clamping and or using surclage cables, I don't think you need that many hands. Josh, when you do that open clamping and, and passage of cables, you, you mentioned doing it you know, judiciously, but tell me a little bit about your technique and, and how not to you know, attack the femur when you're doing that. I mean, I think it's like most of the things you know, we've learned through AO through the years where when AO first started, it was you know, largely strip every fragment to make it anatomic, lag it, compress it. But now we, we only clean the fracture lines where we need to see them to allow for clamp placement, leaving soft tissue attachments. And so I think if you're gonna use, when you're gonna use surclage cables or wires, you don't wanna take all of the soft tissue off of each of the fragments. You pass it with a, with a cable passer or a specialized instrument, and then you don't want seven cables over a, 
over a two inch uh, area. You, if you go to some places, you can see x-rays where that's been done and the bone will actually die. It, it will disappear with time. So, you know, one or two cables strategically placed centered over the fragments uh, and, and then using those for cerclage and you can use your clamps as well and then add a cable around the nail. Uh, that can often help uh, placing a cable after your nails in place can prevent you from over compressing a segment uh, if you're off just a little bit, having that nail almost acts as a substrate for the reduction of the medullary canal. Uh, one, one of the other nice things about most cabling systems is it's not one and done, meaning you don't have to pull your tension, crimp it, and that's the only way to hold it. A lot of these systems, you can kind of dial in the tension, and then they have ways like little buttons that you put on the end where you can take the tensioner off check your reduction, put your nail in like Josh said, and then go back and fine tune it. Um, so I don't, I don't ever, if I'm doing a cerclage, I don't ever buy the cerclage, meaning crimp it and cut it until I know it's exactly where I want it and exactly how, how as tight as I want it. All right, so we'll move on to the next. So he, now he shows up at six weeks. At this point, he comes to my office. Uh, no falls, but he's had a dramatic increase in his pain. Um, you can see that he's now broken both of his distal interlocks. Um, I don't know. I don't think the blade slid out anymore. I think it's probably bottomed out at the nail at this point. You know, so you're seeing, I'm seeing some callus. You know, you, you see some, some callus a little bit on the medial side, even at that tip where he's, he's gapping on the lateral cortex and he's definitely got some callus posteriorly. Um, but he's pretty upset. He's in, he's in a ton of pain. He doesn't like how the x-ray looks. Um, despite how, you know, any reassurance. So do you guys, do you guys pull the trigger at this point about doing something surgically? I think it's I'm, really, I'm, oh, go ahead, Chad. I was just gonna say, I'm not as concerned about the x-ray as I am the history. I mean, he's making callus here, the race is on, uh, the implants all already failed. But the thing that worries me is that you're telling me his pain is actually getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the, if the pain's still increasing now, if it was increasing and it stopped a week ago or leveled off, I, I may counsel him differently. I think the symptom, at, the symptoms and the and their course are going to be important, but I don't think he's likely to shorten much with that degree of posterior callus and even see some anteriorly. You're seeing a little bit laterally there, even on the distal segment, and so I think a lot of this is going to be time spent with him. Both distal interlocks are broken. Um, but I don't think he's likely to lose length alignment rotation at this standpoint. So I think if you're going to do something, if his pain's still increasing, maybe it's a little bit less. Maybe it's just adding some cables or cerclage now uh, around that proximal segment. And the other option is revising the whole construct. I, I do think the the blade that's backed out can be bothersome to the vastus lateralis and even the IT band when it's backed out that much. So I, I think you've got to take the symptoms and, and discuss with him the treatment options and, and how aggressive you're going to be if you're going to go in at all uh, operatively. But if his pain's getting worse, I tend to intervene surgically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what I thought, you know, so kind of, you know, when I look at, look at these just non-unions and failures in general, you know, you want, you want to have some idea of why it's failing. Um, and some plan of how to do something different the second time. So six weeks from now, we're not having the same conversation, All right? So in general, you can kind of break it down to the mechanics and the biology. So mechanically, what's going on here? You know, there, there can be issues with stability, either too stiff of a construct or too flexible of a construct. You know, as we talked about, you know, we don't really have the, the, the fragments captured very well. We didn't reconstitute the tube completely and held and hold it. So in my opinion, this is too flexible. Um, the alignment, you know, thou shalt not bear us. It was not egregious to begin with, but I think we were asking a lot of this implant, especially in a tall person. Uh, so any amount of varus kind of sets you, sets you up for some failure. And then again, to the adequate fixation, what's bearing the load? In this construct, the nail is taking all of it, right? Because there's no compression, no contact between the fracture fragments. So again, we've just asked a lot of this implant. And then you have to think about the biology too. It was not an open fracture to begin with. They did do an open reduction, which is fine, but even in the most judicious of hands, an open reduction is still an open reduction, right? So there has been some vascular compromise to this fracture. Um, you always have to think about your host factors. He's not diabetic, he's very tall. So there's a lot of 
um, force on this implant, but he was not very, he was not obese. And then always, anytime I see something fail this quickly, I worry about infection, especially in someone who had been opened, um, even if they didn't have other risk factors for it. Uh, any, any other things that you guys consider when you're looking at these? Just one question that came up in the chat box, Jen, that may relate just to this, you know, kind of too flexible, too stiff is what about the, the proximal lag screw or, or, or helical blade here? Do you statically lock that? Is it left dynamic? Is there, is there a role or do you guys have a rule of thumb for either? Yeah, I, so for me, um, if if there is a subtrochic, so I worry more. So that you could argue that this is a pertrochic, right? So there's a subtrochic extension, then there's also that maybe complete, incomplete vertical fracture line that went up through the GT that you talked about. Um, of those two fracture lines, to me, the subtrochic is the more concerning and the one that's going to put me at bigger risk for problems. So if the main fracture line is not perpendicular to the axis of that head element. I lock it because I don't want it to collapse. And, and I know there's concerns that if you lock it, it can cut out. Um, but for me, if there's, if there's a subtrochic component and that's where a lot of the deformity is, then I tend to lock these. Josh, yeah, any think, different thoughts? Uh, for me, if it's a, so if it's a more standard intertrochanteric fracture line, greater to lesser, I'll tend to leave them length unstable so it can shorten and compress. Whereas if it has that any reverse obliquity component or anything down the shaft, I'll try to compress it intraoperatively and then make it length stable. Uh, so it should not shorten. Great. For this, this I'd make it length stable uh, unless I think there's a standard line, the, a standard intertroke line up there I wanna compress. Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, all right, let me get back to it. So, you know, it, yeah. So if you if you're deciding to 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 go in after it again, which uh, after having talked to the gentleman, we we decided to to go in and operate again. You know what now, right? So in in some instances, sometimes it's a little bit easier if the first case was done poorly because you actually have bone tracks and options. If the first case was done really well, then you really have to sit there and think about, okay, what am I going to do differently so that I don't repeat the same errors? You know, so if you're going to revise the nail, how are you going to improve it? Are you going to use the same type of implant? Do you want to convert now? Do you want to do some type of plate, either a proximal femoral locking plate or a blade plate, something that's a really strong fixed angle? You know, do I need biology? Do I need to bone graft this? Is there, there is a gap. You know, if I reduce it, is that gap going to be gone? And I don't necessarily need to worry about taking bone graft from a separate uh, location. And then I, I tend to, to get non-union labs um, you can argue you probably didn't need him in this case because it was such an early failure uh, and he didn't have any other risk factors. But, you know, if there's something relatively important and easy, not easy to correct, but I mean, if they have a, a really a thyroid that's just not functioning, you know, surgery, you're going to need surgery to, to improve this, but you want to stack the deck in your favor and you don't want to ignore something that you can otherwise impact positively. Do you get these labs, Josh? Uh, I, I get some of the labs. I definitely get vitamin D. I think the other ones uh, are good to get. I think here it's a mechanical failure. Uh, so I'm not as concerned about the infection and metabolic. That said, I, I agree with you. Stacking the deck in your favor is not a bad thing. Uh, I just wonder if treating all these uh, is if you get an appropriate construct and take care of the mechanical issues, if it makes a difference, that needs research to know the answer. Yeah, I'm I wouldn't hang my hat just on this. I'm in Canada. Everybody's vitamin D deficient, so I've stopped testing. We just treat everybody. <laughs> uh, but I agree, the inflammatory markers here. I, just the one, it was an open nailings, and, and there's a lot of callus there early on, which is always concerning for infection. Uh, but I, I think, and I agree with Josh, probably more of a mechanical problem here, I think, than a biology problem. So I'm not so much worried about bone graft as what you're going to do to improve your stability. And I think the only question with bone grafting more becomes if you're there and you're going to do a reaming or exchange the nail, you know, considering something like a rea to harvest, if you're going to do that anyway, may maybe you aren't thinking you need biology, but if it's low risk and uh, non additional access point, I, it may come into play, even though I agree with you and Chad that that's not uh, 
the primary things it needs. But if it's low cost and easy to put there, uh, I, I may take it and, and just use it to, st again, stack the deck in our favor. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I agreed with you guys. I, I thought that this needed stability. Uh, and I also wanted to rule out infection again because of how much bone there was forming so early. So I decided to revise the entire nail because I didn't know that I was going to be able to change his alignment with the nail in place. So I took the nail out. Um, I was planning on putting another nail back in. And because that blade was in a good position in the neck, I wanted to make sure that I still had some fixation. Uh, we can, we're gonna talk later about you know, other ways of improving your fixation if you're going back with a similar type of implant. But I used allograft to bone graft the track. Um, I opened it. I did not take down any more callus than I had to to change his alignment and put two cerclage wires. I cultured him. And then um, the other thing that I did, and Josh is going to talk more about this trochoformic starting point, but because he wasn't a little bit of varus to begin with, and because I was putting another intermedullary nail in, I chose to medialize my start point. There's a couple of different ways of doing this. What's circled there is actually just a, an ADP directed drill bit. Uh, it's a large drill bit. It's a drill bit you would use for an interlocking screw. Uh, and I used that to medialize my start point. So that went in once the nail came out before I re-reamed, put the intra-reamer in again, and I kept that drill bit in as the nail was going in just to medialize it a little bit to, um, to try and push myself out of uh, varus. And then I, the nice thing was they had a relatively short blade in to begin with, and Chad noticed that with the offset. So I was able to upsize the, the length of the blade so that I had a little bit more purchase, you know, so other things to consider, did I need to put a helical blade back in? No, you could have switched that to a screw, right? There were other things you could have switched. I could have switched implant companies that had a different type of head element up top. And then again, we kind of already answered the question of, do you lock it or not? I'm still worried about that subtrope reverse obliquity fracture. So I, I chose to lock the head element that I put in. So question that just came in in the, in the chat box is, is about that proximal element. You know, here, as you said, you had a, there was a good blade path. It was in a good trajectory. You had a little bit more room to go in the head. But when might you consider switching to a construct that has, you know, two screws or, or a different head element? Josh, do you have any, any thoughts there? I would hear. I mean, I think the, the literature on, on the devices with the, with the interdigitating screws, uh, you know, says it's stiffer. There's a little bit of bias in that. Um, but I, I would consider switching it there uh, for this one just to get that stability and rigidity. And then I would make this one link stable as well, uh, like Jen said, so that it's not backing out. And I, I want this construct uh, not to move proximally. And then finally, just before we move on, another question, you know, would you ever consider a piriformis entry nail now for this revision? Or do you stay with a, a trochanteric entry like was done here? The and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. So mo the piriformis nails will have recon options. I don't know of a piriformis nail that's actually a hip fracture stem that's gonna have as big of a proximal diameter. Um, I, I definitely wanted something strong up top that I could lock. And if you medialize it, and, and again, Josh is gonna talk about this in, in these cases and also with the bisphosphonate, if you medialize, if you really medialize a trope start nail, then you can actually induce a little bit of valgus, which is a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think piriformis nail, um, I, I, I think you could use that here. I think the fixation's probably not as rigid. And, and if I were gonna use it, I'd want an intact lesser trochanter. And, and I would not only want the cephalomedry screws, but some of the new designs that have you know, cephalomedullary plus two, one or two interlocks into the lesser. Here with the lesser being displaced, I think it's gonna decrease your proximal fixation. So I, I would probably opt for an interdigitated nail with two screws proximally on this one would be my, my choice. But that said, I think your reduction is great. I think the cables do a lot for stability. Yeah, so this is, so the, the, the center picture is, is the post out from the revision. Um, you can see a little bit longer I sunk the nail, not quite as much actually, just so I had a different, little bit different track for the, the blade, a little bit longer blade. You can see the two surclages on it and just the, 
relatively subtle change in the alignment. Again, he was not that bearish to begin with. But it just goes to show that any bit of bearish can set you up for failure in these. So this is how he looks down below. Again, still have a lot of that callus in the posterior aspect. And then at six weeks, his interoperative cultures, I hadn't held them for 14 days. They came back negative, which was great. At six weeks, I started to see a little bit more callus forming. So I allowed him to be weight bearing as tolerated, which might've been a little aggressive, but in all honesty, he was doing it anyway. And then at eight months, he was walking without a lump and had returned to his high speed bike riding. So take home messages for this high energy in, in an aged person is still high energy, right? So these, even though he's 70, that's not that old, but the nature of his injury means that you can't just put this on a fracture table, pull on it and expect it to behave. Um, and you want, when they have these long fracture spirals, you want to consider reconstituting the load sharing portion of the fracture if possible. If you are going to revise it, don't repeat the same mistake. You know, have a plan for what you're going to do to change whatever needs to be changed. And if they do have good biology, then you need to figure out some way of adding stability. All right. Any other questions we need to address from that before we move on to Josh's? No, I think that's great, Jen. Thanks. Let's move on to Josh's case. And uh, I think it'll bring up some more of these similar points. All right. So here... Here we have a 36-year-old female. She was in a motor vehicle collision four years ago. Uh, she presents to my clinic now four years out from her index surgery with left proximal thigh pain. Uh, she's able to walk without assistive devices, um, but she's not able to work. Um, of note, uh, she's super morbidly obese with a BMI of 67. Uh, her first surgery was in 2016, uh, where she had OR and a retrograde IM male. Uh, and then in it was 10 milliliter diameter, and, and you can see retrograde was chosen there. And then in 2020, she underwent an exchange retrograde intramedronale. Cultures were taken and were negative at that time, but up to a 13 diameter nail, which you can see here on the right. So again, there you can see her clinical history, uh, but she would like to get back to work. She does take care of her kids at home. Uh, and she's not been working now. She also had an acetabular fracture and has some post-traumatic arthritis, uh, but does not have any anterior groin pain. It's, it's only in the proximal thigh, and she doesn't have much uh, pain with hip range of motion. So Jen, Chad, uh, here we are uh, with this patient who's got some soft tissue challenges due to her size. Further workup, uh, what are you thinking at this point? Go ahead, Jen. I would definitely want some baseline inflammatory labs. Um, as you alluded to, I mean, she's, she's quite big and they've got cerclages in there, which means at some point somebody made a, a fairly large incision on her to get those in there. So I, I would worry, you know, it's always in the back of my mind just to make sure she's not brewing something in there. I agree. Yeah, she had two, she's had two surgical interventions already. So I agree. Infection, infection markers. Uh, you know, some of these morbidly obese patients, despite their size, are actually malnourished. Um, so I might consider, you know, pre-albumin, that type of thing, to just make sure that she's optimized the vitamin D levels, uh, as you discussed. Yeah, and we, and I think that's a great point here. I mean, here, this, it looks like she's had a good reduction, the nails maintaining stability, but She'd been sent to our endocrinology clinic and optimized and actually had a course of teriparatide uh, for more than a year, uh, along with correction of other deficiencies and still had a persistent pain that wasn't changing. And so here's her white count, which was normal. Uh, ESR and CRP were both slightly elevated. Uh, I didn't opt for any other imaging. Uh, I didn't know how that was going to necessarily change the plan, although I think you can argue for it. And then even with her size, she's not diabetic yet. Blood glucose is 100, 105 and she's medically cleared. Um, so, so I guess you get to this point now whether she's, she's been in the metabolic clinic, they've optimized what they could, they've done a course of teriparatide. Jen, Chad, what are you doing with her at this point? She's about a, a year after, uh, a year and a half after exchange nail and still having pain. 
Yeah, I'm not sure I'd image her either. Um, I think the, the the she's making callus here. The, the lateral cortex clearly is deficient. So again, it probably wouldn't change what I do. I think she's still mechanically burdened here. I'm not a big fan of exchange nailing through the knee. And um, I, I do worry a bit about the proximal fixation here. So I probably would be converting at this point to something that's anti-grade. So a cephalomedullary type nail, try to get her, she's just a little bit of varus here. So try to correct her mechanically and then operative cultures, um, just again, to rule out infection. As you said, her inflammatory markers are a little bit elevated. So I'm still concerned about that. Chad, so one stage? For Even me, one, st one stage with, with those markers just being slightly elevated, I think having a, having a non-union and, and, and some of her other comorbidities might be enough to explain those numbers but definitely gonna wait on the cultures and, uh, and then treat her with suppressive antibiotics if they're positive. Yeah, I'm pretty gun shy of infections. I, I would probably have a low threshold for, and, and it's not the easiest thing in the world, but at least considering talking to her about putting an antibiotic nail in, some, some version of a, a temporary, however you wanna make it, um, antibiotic eluding device with my plan to take it out after her cultures are finalized. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of different options. I, I talked with her about several of them, uh, given her size and challenges and, and her social situation at home, being a single mom with the kids. I didn't really think this would necessarily heal her, but we, we talked about just dynamizing this uh, with the thought of if that's not making any improvement in symptoms by six weeks, uh, then, uh, then we go ahead and proceed to the next stage. Uh, I think usually dynamizing is going to be for a, uh, for a non-union that's developing earlier, that's delayed, not something that's getting a little bit more recalcitrant a year out, but we felt there was little design, little downside. Um, and it would be a part of the bigger procedures ahead, uh, if she's not improving. I, I don't know, is that, what do y'all think? Jen and Chad, is that bad bad thought process or is it okay for her? I don't think it's a bad thought process. I think you have to have that discussion with the patient. Uh, you know, early on, the success rate with dynamization is much higher, as you said. Um, for an established non-union like this, you know, you might quote her thirty percent chance of success, but it's a very low morbidity operation. If it works for you, you look like a hero. Uh, so I think little downside in trying it, but I, I wouldn't, you know, send her away for another six months to see what happens. I'd give her, as you said, probably six or eight weeks. And if she's not better then move on to the next operation. Yeah. And so here she was eight weeks post dynamization. I think there was a little bit of COVID delay. I can't remember if it was me or her, uh, for this one. Uh, but she did have continued thigh pain. Uh, she's still able to walk without assistive devices. And I think what next, and I think you'll probably answered that earlier. Um, Jen, you, you would, sounds like with the indices up, you'd prefer more of a staged protocol and Chad, you'd likely go to one stage. Would you recheck labs at this point at all to see where she is, or would you proceed off the old, old numbers? I think if she's early in the post-op phase, your, your numbers might be up a bit more, but unless something's changed clinically, I probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't repeat labs. Yeah, and the, and the two stage also, it kind of depends on how much of a, a surgical risk she is, right? She seems, even though she's big, she's not terribly unhealthy. You know, sometimes these patients are so obese that just intubating them is risky. You know, if, if it's one of these things where I really just don't want to put her to sleep twice, then, then do it in one stage, unless you see pus coming out of the canal when you take the nail out, which is always a possibility. Josh, Dr. Anglin's saying with a, a you know, a, a hypertrophic non-union like this dynamization, you're actually making it even more unstable, where what this really wants is more stability. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I agree. I think in general, I mean, I, is this hypertrophic laterally? I don't know. I agree with Dr. Anglin. Immediately, we see the callus and we see some posteriorly, but I still don't know what's going on laterally. And I think a lot of times the x-rays can show us we aren't looking down the non-union line which he knows, but uh, I, I think if we're going into the, this isn't working, which I didn't, I didn't think it was high success rate. I think we are going into more stability. And the question of whether you do that with a larger diameter nail or with augmentated plating, uh, I, I agree that this is gonna need more stability. Yeah. And so I did uh, wanna do a staged approach 
uh, for her because of the because of her body mass index and because of the size. And so we did a RIA, and then given that she was now about six years out, uh, I elected not to stabilize her because I was planning on my next stage coming back anagrade, uh, likely in a lateral position. And I did not want to uh, have a retrograde antibiotic nail in the knee that could back out further and uh, be difficult to fetch. You can fetch it in a lateral position, but on someone of this size, I felt it might be hard. Um, so I, I don't know, Jen, Chad comments. Am I crazy for not stabilizing her and giving her some crutches saying we're planning to come back? I think it's brave, but uh, you know, I, I, I would be worried about her having more instability and, and just completing the fracture. But I guess even if she does break, she's getting the same operation when you bring her back to the OR. So not a huge risk, but I think you'd have to educate her to be extremely careful with those crutches until you get her back to the OR again. And I probably wouldn't delay too long. I'd, I'd wait till I got my final culture results back and then I'd, I'd be acting sooner than later. Yeah, yeah I, I would document the heck out of that. Those conversations. That, that conversation might get recorded, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she, and she's a very compliant and knowledgeable patient. Um, and we, those are the exact conversations we had. Um, and so we waited on cultures to finalize on her, uh, two weeks, she was doing okay. I did want to wait till three, uh, just, to, for the more fastidious organisms, uh, especially with the P acnes or I can't remember what they've changed the name to maybe C acnes now. Um, uh, and she's not had too much pain. All cultures are no growth to date. Uh, and then it took five weeks for her to get back and she did shift a little bit. She had increased pain, but this is, uh, this is where she was. All her incisions are well healed. Cultures are no growth and her ESR and CRP now have uh, returned within normal limits at 19 and 4.5. Uh, so anything different in y'all's treatment plan at this point? No, I'm going to integrate. I, I would still stick yeah. with an intramedullary device in my hands. Absolutely. Open approach, closed approach. I might be tempted to try this closed if I can get her aligned and there's no deformity. I'm going to try to accentuate her valgus proximally uh, uh, just by altering the entry site slightly more medially. And uh, if I can't get it reduced, then, then I would go open. But she's got some biology here. This is kind of, I wouldn't necessarily say hypertrophic, but oligotrophic. I think if you ream her and give her a little bit more stability, that might be all she needs now. Yeah, I would try close too. I mean, you just had a nail in there a couple of weeks ago. So there's a, there's a path. Um, again, maybe not the most ideal path, but it, in someone that size, it's worth a shot. As long as you like your alignment, don't leave the OR if you don't. But Yeah, and you know, I, I, I get, I chose, I was planning on opening her because I felt that this was a fairly recalcitrant oligotrophic non-union. Um, and, and on some of the views, it looked like you could see that, that line that looked like a winding river. And, and I felt like I needed to try to clean the, uh, clean the non-union site as well as increase the stability. So I chose for increasing stability and biology um, for her. Uh, so I planned open debridement of the non-union and a great inch measure nail uh, with a cephalomedrary screw and screws into the lesser. On an OSI flatbed, she was below the weight limit. Uh, and then for for biology, I plan to do a RIA, like we talked about, and collect bone graft, uh, and then use that locally, and then off-label augment with BMP. I, I felt like if I was going to be down on a patient this large, um, I, I felt like this was a kitchen sink femur, given it had already had an exchange nail, um, and I wanted to give it everything I could to get it to heal. So this is just showing, again, We'll talk more about it later, but this is more of a trochaformis start point. Uh, so we're, we're medializing it just lateral on the troch. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit difficult with her panis. There's a better view of it. But you can see where it's not a true greater trochanteric start point, but trochaformis. Uh, and then just proceed down. Uh, we use the rea to collect, make sure that that stayed central. And then here's a 15 millimeter greater troch entry nail. And here you can see we're using the tip of the nail just to bring in some valgus uh, as we go across this non-union site. And this is after we've cleaned it. Uh, and then we just put our cephalomedrary fixation in, some additional fixation into the lesser trochanter with this rod. And then distally, 
we locked her dynamically to allow this to have a little bit of compression with weight bearing. And so here are our final, uh, Yes, these are these are images six weeks later. But Jen, Chad, what are your thoughts at this point? You know, I think it's subtle, but I think you've corrected that varus deformity that she had before just by using that trochoformis start with a troch nail. So I, I think that's nicely corrected her mechanical axis. That plus your biology plus or minus the the BMP uh, probably will be enough to get her across the line. Yeah, I like it. I feel a lot happier with it being integrated for sure. Yeah, and so here she was at six weeks uh, after the anti-grade nail BMP. Uh, we're seeing the the non-union line that was lateral and persistent. Uh, it does appear that the bone graft is there. I don't really think it's callous anymore because we bone grafted it, but her pain in her thighs decreased. Her wounds have all healed well. Cultures have been negative, and she's walking without assisted devices and making her plan to try to return to work. Nice. So just before we move on to the to the next session, we'll just open it up if there are other questions uh, uh, for the chat box uh, to discuss these two cases of, of pertrochanteric fractures. One case that's come in there or a question, Josh, you know, what are your thoughts for primary nailing of, of either subtrochs or, or transverse mid shaft fractures of dynamic locking? You mentioned dynamic locking here during this revision case, but do you ever use dynamic locking primarily? I think there's, I think we've got great evidence out of that, out of shock trauma back in the nineties with Brumbach and Burgess. And so I think that the, for link stable patterns and we can go back to the Winkless classification, but what happens is at least at shock trauma in those days, there were about 10% that had an unrecognized butterfly fragment. And so when they lay, let them weight bear, some of them shortened about 10% and, and were required revisions. So after they did that, they just went to ream statically locked nails with screws on both sides. And granted, dynamic in the day did not mean a screw in an oblong hole. It meant no screw at all. But once they went to ream statically locked, they had a 98.5% 98, 98 union rate. And Burgess says the one non-union was his, and he put it in Varus if you talk to him, I think. But he said the one was his. So I, I still prefer ream statically locked inch medjury nails. Uh, for femoral shaft fractures early on based on that paper. I think here we, we aren't going to have an unrecognized butterfly, butterfly fragment that'll cause too much shortening. So I'm trying to do everything I can to stack the deck in my favor and get this to heal. So one question is, if you really wanted this to be more stable, then, then why lock dynamically? Could you just have locked this statically as well? Do you think it mattered? I, I think you could have. I don't know that it, I don't know that it made any difference. I just did want this in, I did want this to have impact as it goes across. I think the, the motion can help it heal. I think it's got stability with alignment in the coronal and sagittal planes. Another uh, question, question is a good one. Would you consider a plate augmentation since you were doing an open approach on it anyway? Yeah, you know, I, I thought long and hard about it. I think going up to that big of a diameter nail, I would have been placing more cables around the callus. And then with her size, if, if this does get infected and I've got to fetch it, I'm not having to do an open approach necessarily uh, to just fetch the nail and the interlocks. That was one of the reasons I didn't do an augmentative plate here. Gotcha. May have done it in a thinner patient. Someone else mentioned about regarding the, the medial start point. Do you widen the canal proximally to allow for valgus shift? If they have tight canals, I find it cha challenging. What do you do if you have too tight a proximal segment? I've usually just used the entry reamer, which is usually a little bit bigger uh, that comes with whatever rod, whatever company you're using. And I, I've not seen a need to widen it more. I think you can definitely take bigger diameter reamers up top of up to 15, 16, if you need to, just in the proximal segment. I've not found that that's been needed. And I've all, whenever I've done trochoformis with a troch entry nail, I, I've really liked the valgus I see going across and, and not found I needed to ream more up top. I think, in a, I think it's an important time to point out with this trochoformis start, this is not for all femurs, right? This is for, for pertrochs, because if you start pushing the envelope and doing trochoformis and young people for femoral shafts, then we're starting to increase the hoop stress around the femoral neck, right? So this, this, is, this is not 
every femur now we're not doing a trochoformis start, correct? Yeah, this this was specifically because it was non-union, had not healed. And that was another reason I wanted a device that had a screw going across the the neck component as well, just to protect that, because I don't want to see her come back with a femoral neck fracture around that nail down the line. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chad, you want to move on to the bisphosphonate ones? Yeah, I think that'll be the next step. So just to, to set the stage again, we're going to move on now to atypical femur fracture cases. Uh, we'll reverse the order. So Josh Gary, again, from the University of Southern California, is going to present first, uh, followed by Jennifer Hagen from the University of Florida. All right, so here's a 73-year-old female now. She's low energy fall. Uh, she had some antecedent right thigh pain. Uh, for two months before this fall uh, and the, in the acute presentation today, she's not told me about any left thigh or hip pain, even with questioning on that side. Uh, she did have bisphosphonate, was treated with bisphosphonates after an elbow fracture that was treated operatively and healed in 2017. And she has minimal medical comorbidities. Jen, any things, any pertinent positives we've missed in the history or Chad, anything we've, we've not covered here? Well, you're asking about her contralateral. So you're asking about her left thigh and hip pain, but are, do you do anything else to, to investigate that? Or you just take them at their word that they're fine? I, you know, I think x-rays are pretty low morbidity and I, you know, seek that disease, don't hope that it's okay. I, I do get full length films to look for beaking. Uh, and I've seen beaking very proximal. I've also seen it all the way down near the metadaxial region distally. Uh, which isn't common, but it can happen. So I, I do like getting the films just to know so I can have a conversation with the patient. So Jen, if you see that lateral beaking, but the patient tells you they're entirely asymptomatic, do you tell them they need an operation? How does that conversation go for you? Um, it, so a lot of it depends on the patient, you know, if they're, how reliable they're gonna be. If, if I only see beaking, they have no pain, and I don't see any evidence of the dreaded black line or stress fracture or anything like that. I, I tell them it's okay to consider watching it, especially if I'm operating on the other side, because I'm gonna see them pretty routinely for the other side. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I can catch it if they start becoming symptomatic. Um, if there's any question about their ability to follow up or any question about their having vague pain on that side, um, I strongly suggest to them that we prophylactically treat it uh, not in the same setting. I, I agree with Josh. I would do it as a separate prophylactic procedure just because that is a lot of fat emboli to shower to the lungs. And if within that beaking, if you see that little transverse lucent line, that so-called dreaded black line, Josh, for you, is that, is that an absolute indication for surgery, even if, if they don't think they have pain? I'll, I'll push them towards it. I, I wouldn't say it's absolute, but I'd say it's probably going to be absolute when it completes within the next year. Um, yeah. if they don't want it done. So I'll, I'll push them towards it. Push them. Okay. Perfect. So, so here, here were, here's some more x-rays for her, including a, a nice cross table lateral showing the displacement and flexion. So she's active. She walks three to four miles a day. I guess, Jen and Chad, what position, what bed, what type of reduction and how, and then what implants? Uh, I like these lateral. I like a lot of proximal femur stuff, so lateral, um, even if they're not, even if they're not big. Um, so for me, it's lateral beanbag, flat top. And I would have almost no hesitation opening this because this is such a short proximal segment, even with a perfectly placed starting point. Um, I'm, you're going to have a hard time, especially looking at that lateral. It looks like there's some deficiency in the cortex posteriorly. I think I would have a hard time getting it out of flexion and maintaining it out of flexion if I didn't open it. To, just to be a contrarian, for, for me, most of these are done supine with a bump under the hip, uh, distal traction. I agree, though, this is going to be one that's not going to reduce closed. I would probably start with percutaneous adjuncts, so either a, a unicortical shans pin or a ball spike pusher. And if I still just simply can't get an adequate reduction before we start reaming, I'd have a low threshold to open it as well. Yeah, so... I, I do prefer lateral on these. I, I like open reduction. I'm going to place, if I'm going to use a nail with cephalomedroid screws, I'm generally going to be making an incision to place those anyway. So 
I, I feel like I can take advantage of that incision for open reduction, slightly extending it. And then I like an OSI flatbed, uh, again, reduction open, and I'm gonna plan a long uh, greater choke entry cephalomedroid nail. And so here's what we did. I think valgus is your friend for these injuries and you can see the open reduction in a clamp through that lateral approach. And again, a trochoformis starting point, even though we're going to be using a greater troch entry nail will help promote valgus. And one thing here, you can see there's the intraremer going in trochoformis, the guide wires in, and then using this clamp too as a manipulative aid to help bring out valgus while we ream. And so just continuing with that on down, reaming preferentially. And so we can see as the nail comes down with this trochoformis and especially with the greater troch bend, we're going to induce valgus. And then just using here, here's a, a device that can have two uh, interdigitated screws. We just chose one screw since we weren't controlling a, uh, an inner trochanteric component, have good position and then locked her distally and did a long nail. And you, it's a, it's a nail that actually gets down uh, past the metaphyseal bone. Jen, Chad, any comments, thoughts? I think that's a really nicely executed case, a great example of, of restoring that valgus. Uh, you know, uh, these are even more intolerant, I think, of malreduction than, than normal subtrochs. It's, it's pathologic bone. It's failed in tension initially. That's been the, the failure mechanism has been that lateral tension. Um, so if you can even accentuate the valgus slightly and get these anatomically reduced, I think it significantly increases your chance of success. So that, that, that one controlling the position intraoperatively, if you had to open it and clamp it or, or chance pins or whatever you need to do to get it reduced and hold it reduced during the reaming, even accentuate that, that valgus. And then that, again, trochoformis, a little bit more medial start point like you've used here, clearly has worked very well. There's a question in the chat box. Why not use a piriformis start recon now since it's such a short segment subtrug? You know, I think you can. I think what we know from the literature, these take a little bit longer to heal. And I think the piriformis nails, the issue with them has been the Z effect for failure. Um, and, and I think here we've got a little bit more bulk up top and I can have a set screw come down and, and make it link stable. I could also do two screws and a set screw. I don't know that it's a wrong answer to use piriformis. I just think this promotes valgus. Uh, if I wanted to promote valgus with piriformis, I need to start more medial on the neck, uh, which could be an issue with hoop stresses and creating a neck fracture, especially in someone with pathologic bone. Um, so that's why I choose this. Yeah, and for me, I typically think of a piriformis nail as a young person nail and these more elder geriatric fractures, more of a cephalomedullary device like this and agree with that trochanteric uh, bend to the proximal nail. It helps you accentuate their valgus. So here's our post-operative uh, full-length films. I, I make these weight bearing as tolerated with a walker. Uh, she was active before and probably could have tolerated touchdown weight bearing, but I, I think with elders, uh, it's kind of all or none on weight bearing, and I don't like them going to sniff, so kind of, if I can avoid it. Uh, we stop her bisphosphonates uh, and then are in contact with her bone health clinic uh, to make sure she's optimized metabolically uh, in all other ways, but not on bisphosphonates. Chad, Jen, any other comments, post-operative protocols? No, I think that's that's great. The only other thing, I mean, we struggle to get coverage for it, but is to consider more of an anabolic agent like a teriparatide or something like that. Uh, you know, cost often is prohibitive, but it's certainly something to consider. There's anecdotal evidence that it, it promotes union for these uh, bisphosphonate-associated fractures. And there's a comment saying adding a lateral plate. So again, another one of those uh, plate augments can help for the tension failure of the lateral side. You think there's room for a lateral plate in this particular fracture? I, I think you could place one. You may need some type of cerclage uh, with it as well. Again, I'm always, the first thing I was taught uh, in, my, in my med school and residency by Adam Starr and Charlie Reinert was whatever you put in, how are you gonna get it out uh, if the pus starts stripping? Um, and, and I think here uh, she's got excellent fixation and I don't know how much stability it will add. So I usually don't, even with an open reduction, uh, unless I'm getting into a, uh, 
uh, a repair of a non-union phase uh, down the line. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't like having to compromise the diameter of my nail, right? And as you've alluded to, if you're going to get any fixation in that plate and the distal aspect of the fracture, you're you're at the level of sarcage at that point. Um, or you have to downsize your nail enough that you can get screws around it. And we know these take forever to heal, and we know the nail is mechanically advantageous. So, um, yeah, I'm not a big big fan of that for this fracture either. Question about temporary plate assisted um, anterior reduction. I think if you've got it open, um, you know, you can use a clamp if you're struggling to, to hold or maintain the reduction, a little unicortical provisional plate can be helpful. You just always have to think about what's the biologic impact and, and be very, very judicious with your exposure. Same as with the cerclage wire, that you don't strip too much um, and compromise your biology over your, over your stability. But again, just for provisional fixation intraoperatively. And you've got to make sure your screws are short enough where your reamers or nail aren't going to encounter them uh, in the canal. Um, that can be another challenge. So you don't have a, usually a ton of fixation. It's just unicortical fixation, but nothing, nothing wrong with it if you're not stripping more. Yep. Perfect. So here she was five months post-op. She had a pretty uneventful course. Um, she was walk, back to walking three miles a day, no pain in either limb. Um, and, and has done well, but I think the, the initial valgus and the trochoformis with a greater troch nail uh, helped us here and, and didn't require augments and did well. Nice. All right, so I'm going to bring up my second one, which is one that didn't do quite as well, which is why we're showing it. Oh, where'd it go? There you go. Oh, hang on. All right. So again, we're going to kind of drive home that trochophore from a starting point, accentuating the valgus, and considering maybe the adjunct for teriparatide. So this is, oh, that's why, sorry. So this is a 56 year old female. So kind of classic for the atypical fracture pattern. She's not really an elder. She's actually a very active 56 year old. She had a ground level fall over a curb. She had the harbinger one month of antecedent hip pain and actually didn't see a provider for it. They got an x-ray of a hip, didn't go down far enough. They didn't see the stress fracture. Um, she had been on bisphosphonase for greater than 10 years, and she also is on daily corticosteroid use because she has RA, so she's kind of a biological setup for it. Um, these are our fracture films, very similar to Josh's case, where you can see maybe a hint of that lateral cortical beaking. You can see the relatively transverse nature of this, and it, this is a high energy fracture pattern in a low energy uh, situation. This is her contralateral side. It was asymptomatic. We didn't see any evidence of beaking or any of the black lines, so we let that one ride for now. So she was treated um, by a partner with percutaneous assisted reduction uh, with a trochanteric recon nail. And I chose these two fluoro shots because they kind of did the reverse of what Josh was talking about in his case, right? So their starting point is quite lateral, actually even more lateral than you would do for a, a general trochanteric uh, nail. Whereas with the trochoformis, we want this to be a much more medial starting point. And unfortunately in this case, they pulled it into varus instead of pushing it into valgus because they were paying closer attention to the medial reduction, which is a common thing for us to look at, especially if you more frequently do proximal femur fractures like uh, intertroph fractures, where sometimes we pay attention to that Shenton's line. So I think they just got lost in their reduction and paid attention to the wrong cortex, right? And we know that we would be much better off with the forced valgus like Josh demonstrated in his case. So these are their post-op x-rays. For those two things, again, not really egregious. I mean, they, it's, you know, you can see that there is a little bit of varus. You can see that they are still gapped laterally. Um, in a fracture that was not a bisphosphonate associated fracture, this may, this might have actually done okay. They might have won the race on this if this wasn't so biologically challenged. You guys agree? Disagree? 
Yeah, you know, Jen, if I saw this initially, even with bisphosphonate, I'd still, if I were betting, I'd bet on this healing. I think there are some opportunities to, I, I think the virus, if we measure it out, is probably going to be less than five degrees for sure. But if there hadn't been a big open approach or some assault on biology, I, I would probably bet on this healing. If I didn't know uh, you're asking critiques, I, I would still bet on that with this quality reduction. That said, I would have, like you said, medialized the starting point. I think here's a greater choke entry with two screws, which I don't think is as stable as some of the uh, nail designs for elders, the cephalomedullary nails. Yeah, and, and again, so I, I actually do, I do like this nail and I like this nail in this person because she's only 56. Like I said, she's not really, she's not really an elder. That couple millimeter diameter difference between this and the, and the classic hip fracture stem, you know, and. It, it's something we can get away with. I, mean, I don't like using that phrase, but you know, it, I, I actually, I like this nail for this, this age of patient. So there is a question is, is the Z effect coming? Um, no, your plant, not in this particular case, <laughs> but that's, you know, that is something to worry about with subtrokes and recon screws, especially if you don't put the end cap on the top. I, right. I would have liked to see the starting point just a little bit more medial for this. And do you know the diameter of this nail? Because I question if it's a little bit undersized at the at the fracture site. That's a great question. I think this is a 10. Yeah. You know, I think if you're going to choose greater troke on these, Mike Gardner had a great paper uh, back when he was at Wash U on everyone's anatomy is different. You really probably ought to template your entry point uh, off the contralateral femur. Now, that said, I think medializing it in this situation would be good, but everyone's anatomy is different. And I think fractures proximal to the isthmus, if you're going to use stroke entry, they can be done and be done well, but you should probably template. That's a good point. So here she is at six weeks. She has been weight bearing. Um, that lateral gap is a little more obvious. It could just be the exposure of the x-ray. She got a little teeny tiny bit of, of flexion on the lateral. Starting to heal though, trying to. She's got a little bit of callus posteriorly and a little bit medially. You guys do anything at this point or keep letting it ride? Pain worse, better, the same. What are her symptoms? About the same. Getting better, slowly. I would uh, I would hang some crepe that we may need to do something, but I'd probably let it ride right now and, and see what happens because I don't think the operation will be any different in another four, six, eight, 12 weeks than it will be tomorrow. Yeah. Again, similar to the first case it always concerns me when i see hardware failing early and things moving so i agree with josh i definitely uh, warn the patient that there may be uh you know more operations coming i probably wouldn't let her get too far out of sight so i follow this one closely but i wouldn't if her pain's getting better i would not intervene at this point yeah so she disappeared for quite a while and then came back and saw me <laughs> Unfortunately, or you could, or you so could send her away for a year. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you'll be fine. Get out of here. Yep. Uh, so she came back at 14 months, um, still symptomatic, still having some pain, hasn't been able to return to activities. And this is what her x ray looks like now. You know, so she, she tried. There is some biology in there. There is a little bit of callus on the lateral side and on the posterior side, but, but clearly not as solid looking as we would want at this point. So what now, you know, with her symptoms getting still persistent, getting slightly worse. And with, with this fracture line, you know, I didn't, I didn't think that non-surgical interventions were likely going to make a big change for her. Yeah, it's probably beyond what I would call delayed. I think this is, is a non-union, but interestingly, despite it being a biologic problem, she did try to heal this. She did make some callus. So I think this is more of a, an issue with stability than it is purely biology. I, I agree. I, I think this is, this is a revision surgery for me. So again, kind of going back through the running through in your mind, you know, what, what are the actual issues and what do you want to change, right? So as of now, she isn't in some varus, right? So we, we know, especially with subtropes and bisphosphonates, they cannot be in varus. She's got a little bit of flexion. I'm not as worried about that. I'm definitely a little more worried about the varus. We talked about the nail size. It was a little more obvious on that last x-ray that it's, it's likely that it's undersized, especially in that proximal segment. She could probably tolerate going up at least one to two nail diameters. 
Uh, and then the biology, even though she did try to heal and has some callus, the biology cannot be can written off, especially in someone who was on bisphosphonates for that long, who also was on corticosteroids and still is because of her RA. So again, going down the path, if you're going to revise it, what are you going to do? Am I going to go back with another recon nail? Do I want to now upsize to the hip fracture nail? Like we saw some type of hip fracture stem that we saw in the first case. Um, is this another one where you want to plate it? Is this going to be an open plating case? Do I want to take down the non-union in this case? You know, do I want to leave the callus like I did in the, the previous presentation or do I want to take that down? Do I have to take it down in order to change the alignment? And then again, with the biology, are we going to take the remains and use it as bone graft? Is this something where I want to use something off label like infuse? And it always infected, but she really had no, no signs of infection at 14 months and someone like this. I, I never say never, I always culture it, but I'm less concerned about that and more concerned about the, the biology and the alignment in this case. Would you guys ever change this to a plate? You know, at, at this point, I think I've, you know, she's got a nice diathesis there. I think I would still try an intramedullary device. Um, if it was more proximal, if there was a significant deformity that I needed to correct, that I might swing from a nail to a plate. Uh, one question in the chat box was someone asking about adding an adjunctive device. Um, I think at this point, still my, my first go-to would be an exchange nail, but an adjunctive plate would be a consideration as well if you want to add stability. I think earlier on in the course, Jen, I may have considered augmentative plate and bone grafting. I think at 14 months, I'm worried now about the, the cycles and the load that the snail has had. So even if I'm going to, to think about an augmentative plate, which I think there's good data for, or so, there's decent data for with bone grafting, I think the snail should be switched out uh, to the one that's not been loaded for 14 months. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Even though we don't see any evidence of the nail failing up top, I, I worry about how many cycles it's had for sure. So uh, I did decide to take down the non-union and take out the nail. And since I had an open approach to take down the non-union anyway, I did uh, pulled it in some valgus and did a, a prophylactic temporary plate like we discussed in one of the other cases. Um, same track, I, I medialized the starting point because the starting point was just a little too lateral for me. So that's another one of those ADP directed drill bits. Um, you can also do other things. You can put a fibular strut down there. You can do put a plate in. I like the drill bit because it's, it's temporary uh, and I can take it out and I don't get a lot of metal shavings when I do it. Jen, so the, the purpose of that, rather than going a little bit more distal in that proximal segment and medial, is to have the start point of the nail medialized, correct? It's correct. not about the stability of the construct. It's having your your the med the proximal portion of your nail medialized. Exactly. So you're not you're not repeating the same mistakes as before, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And then this was someone had asked on one of the other cases about back slapping and leaving the the plate in. So I I used her remains for autograft, and after I had passed the nail, I took the so this is a good example of, of the short unicortical screws for your temporary plate, and you don't want them too long, especially in this case, because then that's going to act more like that endosteo bone pushing you into varus. So I took the screws off on one side and then back slap just to get as much compression as I possibly could. Whether or not that works. Yeah. So you lock distally and then back slap, Jen? Mm -hmm. And then did the recon screws up top, which is difficult because you have to make sure that your alignment that your, your version of the nail into the neck is perfect before you back slap because you can't change it after that. So you got to know that those recon screws are going to be in a good position. So I don't love back slapping recon nails because you can really screw yourself if you don't do it right. Yeah, I ever, was going to make that same point. I, I think you just got to pay tons of attention to that. Yeah, well, something I've switched to is putting in the recon screws first and then driving the nail a little bit further anti-grade, supporting the limb distally. So you get the same effect as back slapping, but then at least you know those proximal recon screws are exactly where you want them. Yeah. yeah. Only yeah. issue is you're stressing those screws a little bit as the nail's impacting down on them. So it will work for a small gap, but if, you, yeah. if you're hoping to back slap a one to two centimeter gap, you can create some oh, real no. issues. Yeah, so, I, oh, yeah. I'm more talking about loading, yeah. loading the fracture that's already reduced, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, for sure. So this is her at six weeks. Um, again, I went back with the same type of recon nail, but upsized it a little bit in addition to all the other things we talked about, you know, on the lateral. I either incompletely corrected it or had recurrence. You can see again a little bit more clearly here that she's missing some cortex posteriorly there. So I do still have that flexion. Um, but I'm okay with my alignment on the coronal plane. She's walking on it, not having a ton of pain. And then she, I did, it took a very long time to get her on Corteo. Uh, and it's one thing that for you guys, for the audience to know that their vitamin D has to be normalized before they can start them on the Corteo. So they, they can't start them before, otherwise it, it, it doesn't work. So it took a very long time for her vitamin D to get normalized, but by three months she was started on Corteo, started to maybe make a little bit of a difference. And then at 12 months, still not, completely completely consolidated but definitely healed enough that i felt like we were we were getting in a good place but pain-free walk without a limp but again this is still 12 months revision surgery bone graft on forte these things take a really long time to heal so jen you you, you bone grafted her locally opened it you exchanged the nail and increased her stability and you correct her vitamin d deficiency and, and treated her with teriparatide which of the three things work? Uh, probably all of them. Um, probably the alignment and the increase in the stability, I think was probably the biggest thing, but we'll never know. Yeah. I, I think all important things to consider again is the, is the, you know, what are the mechanics? What, what are the impacts of the biology and particularly in these patients? that they're often systemically compromised as well by the bisphosphonate. So I don't care which one heals it, correct, correct everything, try to optimize the situation as best you can. I think that's, that's a great, great outcome and, and great answer. So I think we'll, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, that's fine. This is just basically summing up everything that, that you just said. Oh. Perfect. So in the interest of time, I think we'll need to, to move on to the discussion of the journal article. So unlike maybe the typical journal to club discussion where we take a multi-centered randomized controlled trial that costs millions of dollars to do, I thought this was a very clinically relevant technical trick uh, that I actually took something from. Uh, this is a paper out of the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2019, uh, senior authors uh, Tim Aker uh, out of UT Houston. And this is a paper that's a, a technical trick and it's medialized trochanteric starting point and focused lateral endosteal beak reaming to optimize success of intramedullary nailing in atypical femur fractures. And this is just a technical trick and a, and a case series of 10 cases, but I thought it was quite impactful. And I hope that some of you will take some, some tips from this. It's a retrospective level four study uh, done at a single institution. It's 10 cases that were done by one of two fellowship trained orthopedic uh, uh, surgery uh, uh, surgeons. Um, they had two early cases that were treated with anti-grade nailing, uh, but the remaining eight cases were treated with a cephalomedullary nail, just like you saw in the previous cases. And all were done using a standardized technique. The first step, just like uh, Dr. Gary, Dr. Hagen showed in their cases was a medialized start point. So this so-called trochoformis start. So it's not truly piriformis. Uh, it's, it's at the medial edge of the trochanter uh, on the AP, more in line with the piriformis fossa, but it's, it's more anterior than that. Uh, so it still needs to be in line with the um, uh, febrile neck. So the so-called trochoformis start. They then, tried to preferentially ream that lateral endosteal beak. So you could see this, this dense beak. And if you don't do anything to preferentially ream that, as the reamer head comes down and runs along that lateral slope, it just reams out this medial cortex where the bone is actually softer. So that then as you go to insert your, your nail, this endosteal beak, if it's still there, it will tip your fracture into varus. So in this case, they've accentuated the valgus here with a ball spike pusher proximally at a unicortical shans pin distally. 
so that the bend of the reaming wire preferentially forces the reamer head up against that lateral end osteal beak. And with focused reaming and a little motion in and out motions with the reamer, you can preferentially grind that end osteal beak down uh, so that it no longer induces deformity when you insert your nail. So it's that valgus translation of the proximal segment. Here's a similar example where they've tried to do that with a ball spike pusher, but still the reamer is being pushed medial. You can see how the medial cortex here is starting to thin out. So a second trick that they've applied here is actually even excessively or accentuating the lateralization of that reaming wire by inserting a curved clamp like a gallbladder or a bone hook to, oh, sorry, uh, to force that reaming wire up against that lateral end osteo beak. And by having it just distal and, and through the fracture site, it, it forces the reamer head to, to take off that end osteo beak, particularly in the proximal segment where it's most troublesome. So you can see here an example where that end osteo beak hasn't really been completely removed. So with insertion of the nail, it forces the proximal segment lateral, it tips the proximal segment into varus. So here what we see is that they've removed the nail. They've used that ball spike pusher and a, a chance pin again to preferentially ream that end, end osteal beak on the lateral aspect so that when that same nail is reinserted now, that varus deformity has been, been alleviated and allows them to, to nail the fracture in an anatomic uh, alignment. And then the third step, as has been discussed already, is insertion of a trochanteric uh, nail with that lateral proximal bend through the fracture site. This is a, a bit of an accentuated or an extreme example uh, where they've actually induced excessive valgus, but the whole purpose here is to improve the mechanics at the fracture site. So by having that trochaformis entry, inserting a troch nail, it, it further accentuates that valgus uh, moment and is gonna help the mechanics at the fracture site. And with the combination of those three techni techniques in those 10 cases, they actually increased the valgus slightly relative to the contralateral femur by an average of 6.2 degrees with a range from one to 11 degrees. Uh, they had no complications in this series of 10 patients. They had one that was lost to follow up, but the remaining uh, nine of that group uh, progressing on to uneventful union. I'll open up for discussion uh, amongst the panelists, Josh or Jen, any, any comments on that or additional tips or tricks you'd like to share? I think the point about them increasing the valgus compared to the contralateral side is, is interesting and important because in one of the previous cases, one of the participants had asked, what if they're varus to begin with? And we do know that a lot of these patients do have coxivera, which may or may not predispose them to having these atypical fractures anyway. So I think knowing that you're actually not getting them anatomic, you're getting them more valgus than they normally were, um, is something that is not, it's old school, um, but it's something that the participants should be aware of that is okay to do. Again, yeah, I this think is... the, I, I was just, I, I learned trochaformis when I was uh, Tim Aker's partner uh, in Houston. I, I picked that up from seeing him do it and it just made sense. And I think it works. And I think that's the power of that article. Like you said, it's only 10 patients in retrospective, but it, it's having in, influence and impact. So I think it's a great article. I think the only other thing I've seen in, in this far image on the, on the left, you can see it a little bit. And here there's a, there's an adequate, diameter of canal, but sometimes in people, especially smaller females, they can have a really tight narrowing from the metaphysis into the diaphysis proximally. And so as the nail tapers from the larger, you know, 17 millimeter diameter proximally down to whatever diameter you're going to use in the diaphysis, sometimes that area can block a nail going further down. Uh, and so sometimes you've got to ream that up. It's, it's not common, but it'll happen. And sometimes you're like, why can't I impact this nail further? And that'll be the reason. So it's just something to watch. So what would you do in that case, Josh? Take the nail out, ream a little bit more? Yeah, just upsize the reamers in the proximal segment only, not all the way across, but just to the area where I need that transition from the larger diameter proximally to the diaphyseal diameter to, to, to sink down to to get proper position of my cephalometric screws. Okay, great point. Jen or Josh, anything else to add? 
stay away no, from I virus. That progression of x-rays is great. It's really yeah. helpful. You know, I think this is a great, just a great uh, um, example for those of you who are saying, you know, how hard it is to publish papers. This is just a case series of 10 cases, but potentially practice changing. So if you have some tips and tricks out there that you think are useful to share with your colleagues, it doesn't have to be a multi-million dollar, multi-centered randomized controlled trial to be very impactful. Um, so share, share your tips and, and tricks and techniques. So just to bring it home here in the interest of time, just to summarize what we've talked about tonight uh, on subtrochanteric and pertrochanteric fractures and, and non-union, I think it's critical that reduction matters. These are extremely intolerant of, of malreduction. And as Josh just said, particularly varus. Avoid varus at all costs. Consider that slightly medialized troch trochiformis uh, start point uh, to induce a little excessive valgus. Again, not with every femur fracture, but with these pertroch fractures and these, these uh, very proximal subtrochanteric fractures to induce a little bit of extra valgus. Careful, judicious use of cerclage wiring may be helpful in assisting you to achieve your, your reduction. As well, if that clamp is helpful, then that cerclage wire theoretically is going to be helpful in maintaining the reduction and increasing the inherent stability of, of your bone nail construct. Careful about the soft tissue stripping, but a careful placement of one or two cerclage wires can be extremely helpful for these, uh, particularly the spiral uh, subtrochanteric fractures. If you're going to be treating the non unions, I think it's important to work them up. Uh, metabolically. Always consider infection in anyone that's had previous surgeries. So CBC, ESR, CRP, uh, check their vitamin D levels or treat them all for, for hyper, hypovitaminosis D. Uh, consider their thyroid function, their parathyroid hormones, um, testosterone levels, and don't forget to consider malnutrition, even in the obese patient. Critically assess their deformity. Um, assess their stability and assess the quality of the initial reduction and think about what you need to change and optimize to get this fracture into a better uh, mechanical environment to promote union. And then finally, assess the biology. Is it deficient? Did it just need more stability or is it entirely atrophic? And what do you need to do to supplement that biology, um, either, either metabolically or perhaps with some type of local, uh, local or, or systemic bone grafting. With the bisphosphonate fracture, it's critical to remember to stop the bisphosphonate. This is the poison that's caused the problem. Uh, it takes a long, long time to reverse, but if they've had one bisphosphonate fracture, they're at risk of others. So make sure you evaluate the contralateral femur, uh, determine whether they're asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Uh, look on those x-rays for any signs of cortical beaking, and particularly if you see that so-called dreaded black line, that little loosened line through that beak, a very high index for considering stabilization of the contralateral femur in a staged fashion, not simultaneous with the fracture, uh, but perhaps during the same hospitalization. Again, avoid varus. Consider even slightly accentuating their valgus. So again, using that medialized troca trochoformis start point, uh, focused endosteal reaming to get rid of that lateral endosteal beak, and then uh, consider supplementing them uh, once their vitamin D levels are sufficiently replete uh, with teriparatide if that's an option at your institution. Some review articles I'll leave you with to consider, and, and you don't need to, to scramble to write these down because you'll have the video uh, of tonight's uh, session, uh, but you can look up these uh, references. I think this is a great one for an overall review of management of subtrochanteric femur fracture non-unions uh, with the lead author, Ken Eagle. Um, and then these two review articles, uh, or articles, one, the review article from the uh, uh, Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, on the overall management of these atypical femur fractures. And again, that technical trick paper that we discussed tonight during the Journal Club, both I think excellent uh, articles that all orthopedic surgeons should be familiar with uh, as we'll all be treating these fractures uh, over time. I'd like to very much thank both of our presenters tonight. Again, Josh Gary uh, from the University of Southern California in, in Los Angeles and Jennifer Hagen uh, from the University of Florida in Gainesville uh, for their time and, and sharing their expertise, taking time away from the families tonight. Very much appreciate your expertise and insight. 
Uh, again, to access, uh, or access this recording, a link will be sent out within 24 hours after the conclusion of tonight's session. Just a reminder to take a, a look at our YouTube channel uh, under AO Trauma North America. There's a whole video series there of anatomic approaches, recordings of sessions such as tonight uh, that can be a valuable resource for you. And finally, a plug for next week's session. Uh, this will be the final uh, fireside of the spring. This is on geriatric distal femur fractures, uh, same time next Tuesday night. That'll be with Dr. Thomas Higgins, uh, Brett Christ, and Dave Rothberg. So it promises to be an excellent educational opportunity. And then a reminder to just please complete your evaluations that follow. I thank you all for your attention tonight. Hopefully you found this uh, a useful experience and I wish you all a great night. <laughs>